Um, <clears throat> well, the first thing I would like to say is just how pleased uh, I am to be here in, in Slovakia. Um, uh, I come from an, an island that was once described by uh, the French writer Chateaubriand as an island behind an island. There's a the big island and then there's a small one that's kind of hiding behind uh, the bigger island. Um, as a population that's fairly similar to Slovakia, around uh, five million. Um, the language that I grew up with was my mother tongue, is not the language that I'm speaking to you now. So I've just said to you in my mother tongue um, that Irish is quite a different language from, from, from English. So the question of what it's like to live if you like, in the space between uh, two different languages, one a global, uh, a major language like, like English, uh, another uh, Irish Gaelic, a small, uh, smallish uh, minority uh, language, and what it's like to live in a state of translation between these two languages uh, is something that um, has often been a concern of mine uh, over the, the years. What I want to do this morning is um, I want to try and think about this question of um, translation, of identity, of language um, in the contemporary uh, digital uh, moment. Um, because if I was speaking to you uh, 15, 20, uh, 25 years ago, uh, there were no smartphones, very few laptops, uh, no Wi-Fi, um, the kind of world that you inhabit every single day where you're constantly moving between the virtual world of Wi-Fi connectivity and the, the world that you live in, speaking, uh, talking to your uh, friends, colleagues, and, and, and so on, um, that these have created enormous changes for how we think about translation, how we think about identity, uh, how we think about the notion of the national and the, the post-national. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin by looking a little bit at what I call the economics of attention, why attention has become the most valuable uh, good in the contemporary uh, economic uh, sphere. Then I'm going to look at what the role of translation is in this new economics of uh, attention. Um, then I'm going to ask the question, um, does it matter what you pay attention to? Is attention itself a kind of a value-free uh, activity? Um, and then I'm going to look at what I call the visibility of the translator. To what extent is the translator visible in this new economy of, uh, of, of attention? Uh, and finally, I'm going to suggest that a way of thinking about uh, cultures like our own, uh, languages which are not uh, major world uh, languages, uh, that the role of, of translation can be thought about not so much in an economics of attention as an ecology of attention. Uh, so as part of this, uh, what I'm working on at present, which is to uh, argue for um, the development of what I call uh, a new translational uh, ecology. So, are you sitting still and paying uh, attention? Um, the familiar injunction of the schoolmistress, probably the kind of thing you heard when you were going to school when you were a child, uh, has become the most important uh, watchword, the most important instruction in the new uh, economy. So, if the notion of economy, when we think about economy, it's to do with the management of scarce resources, then attention in our media-saturated world has become the most precious resource of, of all. Bombarded with uh, radio, uh, television, music, your iPhone, your laptop, uh, all your digital uh, devices. So um, there's lots of things competing for your attention. Um, so attention then becomes the scarcest uh, resource of, of all. Already in the mid-1990s, uh, uh, Michael Goldharber uh, was arguing that with the emergence of digital uh, technologies, uh, traditional factors of production, labor, land, and so on, would decline in importance relative to the notion of attention. Attention will become the most important 
uh, economic uh, factor of, uh, of all. Uh, Thomas Davenport and uh, John uh, Beck in the attention economy understanding the new economy of business predicted that what they called the monetization of attention, turning your attention into, into money, um, where the attention of consumers uh, would be so sought after that they would be supplied with services free of charge in exchange for their attention. In other words, your attention would become such a valuable resource that you would actually be sort of paid to pay uh, attention. Um, and this, of course, in a sense, is what has happened with Google, um, where we can use extremely uh, powerful search engines, apparently, seemingly, uh, free of, of charge. So from the point of view of an economics of attention, there are two immediate uh, challenges. The first is, how do you protect information or attention from information overload? To ensure an optimal allocation of this uh, scarce uh, resource. And this is why you've got all these kind of time management courses which are teaching you how to use your time more effectively. Uh, in other words, if there's all these things competing for your attention, how do you manage your time in the most effective way possible? So this is one of the, uh, the challenges. Um, the second is how do you extract the maximum amount of profit uh, from the capture of this uh, scarce uh, resource. And this is how, if you like, search engines come at uh, a price. Um, for Google, uh, the user is the product. And the user has, uh, the attention span of the user has a very lucrative exchange uh, value. Um, the more she pays attention, uh, the more Google gets paid for her to pay attention. So what these developments highlight is a fundamental shift uh, from an economic emphasis on production to an economic emphasis uh, on uh, promotion. So in, if, if you like, environments that are very uh, information uh, rich, um, a series of media gates exist to filter attention to potential users or uh, customers. And of course, not all of these uh, media gates have the same power uh, coefficient. Uh, an ad in a local college newspaper here in uh, Preshoff will not reach the same audience as an ad on prime time uh, television. So if the absolute cost of diffusing information <coughs> has fallen dramatically over the centuries, <coughs> it's much cheaper to post a blog in the 21st century uh, than to print a book in the uh, 16th. The cost of getting past the filters of pre-selection has risen exponentially. It has got more and more and more and more difficult and more and more and more expensive to get past those filters that are filtering uh, our uh, attention. In other words, as societies are more and more heavily invested in various forms of mediation, from the rise of the uh, audiovisual industries to the emergence of digital technologies, it is less the production of goods and services than the production of demand through the capture of attention um, that absorbs increasing amounts of resources. <coughs> so getting people to pay attention is the main income generator, it's the main source of, of money um, for what uh, Mackenzie uh, Wark in his book, uh, A Hacker uh, Manifesto, has called the vectorialist class. What he means by the vectorialist uh, class um, are the people who own, who control the hard drives, uh, the disks, the servers, the cables, the routers, uh, but also the uh, investment funds, the companies um, that are needed for information to be stored, uh, archived, retrieved, and to circulate between us in space and time. In other words, information, collecting information, distributing information, making information available is a very, very, very big business. Hmm? 
uh, and the people, if you like, who control uh, this information, the access to it, the, the making available of the information, uh, occupy a very important role in this kind of new uh, digital uh, economy. Um, and the importance uh, of uh, this particular uh, class um, was uh, borne out by figures that were cited in this book by uh, two MIT uh, economists, uh, Brynjolfsson and McAfee, The Race Against the Machine, where they pointed out that the income that was held by equipment uh, owners continues to rise in the United States as opposed to income going to labor. Salaries in the United States, for example, between 2000 and 2015 um, have remained static in most cases, and 15% of cases have actually dropped. Um, on the other hand, the amount of income going to the equipment owners, the people who are providing, if you like, the infrastructure for the new information economy, has risen by uh, 26%. Of course, there's a sense in which um, getting or gaining people's attention may be an important part you know, of this new uh, economy, um, but it's not the first time this has happened in human experience. Um, Richard uh, Lanham, in his book, The Economics of uh, Attention, Style and Substance in the Age of Information, um, has argued that the science of rhetoric which has been taught in Europe you know, for the best part of 2,000 years and, and more. Um, what was rhetoric basically about? It was teaching uh, students uh, of rhetoric how to capture people's attention. Uh, why Cicero was so important, if you like, uh, in the Roman world and why his legacy would be so important uh, in, in, in European countries from Slovakia to, to Ireland um, was that what rhetoric was about was how to capture uh, people's uh, attention. And often what we call a style, for example, in literature, when we talk about the style of different authors, uh, the importance of style in, in writing, um, style is very often to do with particular strategies that have to be renewed every so often uh, to capture people's attention, to gain your attention as a reader in a, in a particular way. So that notion of gaining our attention has uh, a long uh, history in uh, Europe and, uh, and elsewhere. Another problem that's been with us for a very long time is the problem of information overload. How do we cope with the amount of information that we can have access to? Mm -hmm. um, and to give you uh, an example, um, this is a book from 1621. Um, an English writer called uh, Richard uh, Burton um, called The Anatomy of Melancholy. Um, and in the beginning of this, this book, he talks about how difficult it is. And remember, this is 1621, right? so it's you know, almost uh, 400 uh, years ago. And he's talking about something that affects every single one of us here in this, this room. He says, I hear news every day, and those ordinary rumors of war, plagues, Fires, inundations, thefts, murders, massacres, meteors, comets, comets, spectrums, prodigies, apparitions of towns taken, uh, cities besieged in France, Germany, Turkey, Russia, Poland, uh, daily musters and preparations, piracies and sea fights, pieces, leagues, stratagems and fresh alarms, new books uh, every day, pamphlets, stories, whole catalogues of volumes of all sorts, new paradoxes, opinions, schisms, heresies, controversies in philosophy and religion. And this is before the iPad. Hmm? Um, so this is somebody who is already in the 1620s um, overwhelmed by the amount of information that he is uh, receiving. Now, one of the ways of dealing with this was the invention of indexes, the invention of tables of contents, the inventions of references, uh, bibliographies, and so on. This is very much what's done 
in th that period to try and deal with this information uh, uh, overload. Um, but when we think about the attention scape in our own age, um, how do we uh, deal with this? And where does translation come into the, the picture? Um, one of the things that Burton uh, doesn't mention in his kind of list of all these things that are happening uh, is the question of uh, language. But just think about what he says. He talks about towns taken and cities besieged in France, Germany, Turkey, Poland, uh, Russia. Um, so how does he get information about this? How does he know about what's happening in Turkey, France, Poland, uh, Russia? He knows about it, of course, because there are people who are doing the translating and the interpreting. Um, so that you can only, if you like, pay meaningful attention to something in a multilingual world um, if you have somebody who is involved in the task of language mediation. So in other words, if we're going to talk about the attention scape in a globalized world, um, we've got to figure in, we've got to include the notion of translation, of interpreting, of language mediation, because we cannot pay attention to things that we do not understand. Uh, so in order to capture our attention, in order to gain our attention, we must be kind of linguistically summoned in the language that we can uh, under, understand. So translation then is, uh, must be part uh, of this uh, new eco economics of attention. And if we look at the figures for translation, this does seem to be the case. Um, the demand for translation in the contemporary world, and this should be good news for all of you who are training to be translators and interpreters, is absolutely insatiable. The world cannot get enough translated material. This is important to remember when there are a lot of very pessimistic um, uh, speeches about you know, the dominance of uh, one particular language, the disappearance of translation, the rise of monolingualism. The demand for translation keeps increasing. Um, in 2012, for example, uh, Common Sense Advisory, they often collect information on, on translation. But they estimated the size of the translation service industry uh, worldwide to be about uh, 34 uh, billion uh, dollars. Um, and, um, sorry, this is not worldwide, it's just, just, just for the, the US, the US alone. Uh, and a report by Ibis World, it's another kind of consultancy service, um, said that these translation services um, would uh, reach 37 billion uh, dollars by 2018. Um, the US Bureau of Statistics um, said that the translation industry worldwide is likely to grow by 42% this decade. And they said that this is a very pessimistic uh, calculation. They think, in fact, the growth is going to be uh, even uh, bigger. Um, one translation service provider called Pangeanic said that Globalization and an increase in immigration, which is mentioned by, by the Dean, will keep the industry uh, in demand for the coming years despite downwards cost pressures on services. That's a very kind of euphemistic way of saying that, that as translators we have to fight hard to get paid properly uh, for, what we, uh, for what we do. Um, of course, the kind of the central rationale for in, an investment in translation uh, is the shift in emphasis that we mentioned earlier from production to promotion. Remember what I was saying is that the, the single most important change in the way the new economy is organized is the emphasis that has been placed, the money that's been invested in promotion as opposed to production. Um, in globalized markets with attention as a very, or as an increasingly scarce uh, resource, uh, one way to make people sit up and pay attention is to offer them more products in their own uh, language. And you're probably aware of this. There's numerous studies have shown that when people 
uh, are addressed or summoned in, in their, their own language, their likelihood of acquiring that service or acquiring that good uh, increases exponentially. There's a very, very significant uh, change uh, factor there. Um, so, in other words, that legibility of supply encourages expansion of, of demand. And this is very much, if you read the sales pitch of any of the localization companies, the companies that are, are selling kind of translation of uh, on, online websites and services and so on, they say things like, this is one group, language scientific, website localization or website translation is the process of modifying an existing website to make it accessible, usable, and culturally suitable to a target audience. More than one-third of all internet users are non-native English speakers. That figure now is 47% um, of, of internet users are non-native uh, speakers of English. And according to Forrester Research, visitors stay for twice as long, it's a thing called stickiness uh, in, in, in business, if the website is in their own language. As companies look to expand into new markets, reach a global audience, uh, and increase international sales, the benefits of website localization are clear. So one of the consequences of this kind of upward shift uh, in translation demand on the foot of attention capture in globalized markets is the emergence of a new kind of scarcity, uh, not only of attention, but of translators. Um, one of, for example, um, one of the biggest suppliers of heavy machinery is uh, a group called CAT, C-A-T. You've probably seen some of the clothes as well. They kind of, they sell these CAT boots and, and clothes, but, um, but they produce you know, something like uh, half a million pages of new t technical documentation uh, every month uh, in uh, approximately 42 languages. Um, this technical documentation must reach their, um, the users uh, within 48 hours. Um, because if they don't, um, when the machinery has been modified and they change the software and so on, if it doesn't get to them, there will be serious accidents. Hmm? It is not possible for uh, even a very well-organized group of translators to translate that volume of material uh, in such a short period of, of, of time. Hmm? So there's a real problem th there with, um, if you like, an absence or a uh, scarcity of, of human translators. So, what then is the response to this? Um, Panagenic that I, I mentioned earlier, in their promotional literature, they say, the advent of machine translation technologies should partly address the lack of qualified professional interpreters coping with ever increasing amounts of, of, of data. So computer assisted translation, uh, machine uh, translation, translation memories, a wiki translation where people are collaborating to translate uh, documents uh, online. Um, all of these in their various ways invoke technology as a way of dealing with the ever expanding uh, demand for translated text. Uh, indeed, already in 2006, a man called Alan Melby, who's done a lot of work on machine translation, he said, he made a prediction, he said it was a bit scary, he said that in the future, the only kind of non-literary translator who will be in demand is one who can craft coherent texts that, when appropriate, override the blind suggestion of the computer. In other words, he's saying that in the future, uh, most uh, translation will be done by the machine, uh, but human translators will have the business of kind of monitoring uh, the machine uh, output. Uh, so, uh, I'll be saying a little later why I think this uh, view is wrong, uh, but that's a common view in the, uh, the industry. So this move towards translation uh, automation in the sort of global attention scape uh, raises the question of attentional asymmetry that has already been identified in existing uh, audiovisual uh, media. Um, one of the things that um, has been argued by various media uh, theorists um, is that um, when you capture people's attention, that one of the things that technical devices do 
is they amplify the difference between attention that is uh, captured and attention that is received. For example, um, if you write an email, um, so it just takes you uh, a few, say, 30 seconds to write a two or three line uh, email, you send it to uh, all your, your friends or all your, your colleagues, um, the 30 seconds that it will take to write that email is not the same as all those seconds that are going to be used up by everybody who will read your email. So if 100 people read your email, if 200 people read your email, you're going to multiply that 30 seconds by 100, by 200, by 500, by 600, depending on the number of people who are. So what the, if you like, the device of, uh, you know, the, the digital device is allowing to happen is the amount of time that's used to produce the email hmm, is vastly different from the amount of time that's taken up, uh, if you like, consuming that, that email. Um, so, in other words, that one of the things that's happening in the present moment with, with digital devices is um, what this man, uh, Yves Citon, has called um, the emergence of what he calls a attentional capital gain. In other words, the huge difference between this attention that is uh, given and attention that is received. So, where advertisers, or where you know, television companies, where Google, where Facebook, where they're making their, their money, is there's a huge difference between all of your attention that they are capturing, that they're turning into a revenue stream, um, and the, the relatively small amount of resources that they need to produce, uh, to, if you like, to send out the messages to capture your attention in the, the first place. Uh, and this is why, if you look at, you know, many of these big companies are based in Ireland, like Apple, uh, Facebook, uh, Airbnb, uh, uh, Microsoft. Um, they employ relatively small workforces compared to the vast revenues that they, they generate. And this is because of this kind of uh, attentional um, capital uh, gain. Um, if we look at the um, SISTRAN, which is a machine translation company that uh, system that's used by the European uh, Union, um, it uses um, automated uh, translation. Um, and in a way in which they want to capture the, the live attention of the user. It says, in advertising their products, they instantly understand foreign language content or make your message understood in languages other than English, how with Sistran products. So the attentional capital gain then results from the difference between the dead attention of technical reproduction and the live attention of legibility or reading through translation to make sense of the foreign message. And of course, this is the key uh, generator of income in the informational uh, economy. So how are these different ways then of thinking about attention, uh, about thinking about legibility, uh, and thinking about attention in uh, late modernity? How are we to sort of uh, understand uh, these? And in particular, is there a way of thinking about the relationship between translation and uh, identity and understanding uh, against this backdrop of automation in a way that doesn't produce, uh, if, you, uh, if you like, a sense of despair about the future of human translation, a despair about the role of translation in uh, human societies. Um, one of the problems about focusing on an economics of attention is that it tends to imply a certain set of assumptions, um, notably the kind of the maximization of profits uh, through the minimization of costs in the context of market competition. So, if you like, the standard neoclassical paradigm is the economy is basically about the management of scarce resources. I said this uh, at the beginning. But the ends to which these resources are uh, employed are outside the competence of economists. In other words, that economists would say what we're concerned about is that, you know, you, you manage these resources in as effective a way as possible, but the question of what you do with these resources is not really our, 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 our business. 
The problem, however, is if we just think about attention as solely concerned with means right, and not with ends, do we really have a viable theory of attention? Um, William James, um, in the, the brother of his uh, well, equally famous brother, Henry James, uh, in a book from the 1890s, uh, Principles of Psychology, is often seen as the kind of father of, of, of modern psychology. Um, but he pointed out how a notion of attention that was purely passive could not capture what it happens when we actually pay attention to something. So he kind of criticized the British school of empiricism, which had this kind of notion that we were all a kind of a blank slate, uh, and then we were, were born and we receive all these impressions from the world, these kind of sensory uh, impressions, and gradually we develop uh, ideas, we begin to develop language, and, and so on. Um, and you see that in, in, in um, Mary Shelley's uh, Frankenstein, when, when the creature, when Victor Frankenstein creates his, his creature, how the creature comes to uh, develop his, his thought, how he comes to develop language, is through the experiences that he has in the world. And the reason the creature turns out to be so destructive is that although the experience, the, the, the experience, the initial experiences are very negative for us, right? He's rejected by his maker, Victor Frankenstein. Uh, when he goes to the, the, the house of the, the blind uh, man, he's eventually rejected by the, the, the family and, and so on. So what James says is that this notion of, you know, that we kind of pay attention to the world, we just, we soak in all this information, he said is uh, not uh, true. Um, he says, when you think about it, when you think of the matter, when you think of attention, one sees how false a notion of experience uh, it is, um, which would make our attention merely being present to things happening uh, in the outside world. He says, millions of items of the outward order are present to my senses, which never properly enter into my experience. Why? Because they have no interest for me. My experience, this is the most important, my experience is what I agree to attend to, what I agree to pay attention uh, to. Only those items which I notice uh, shape my mind. Without selective interest, experience is an utter chaos. Um, interest alone gives accent and emphasis, light and shade, background and uh, foreground. So, what James is basically saying is out of the millions of things, right, out of the literally thousands of things that are happening in this room at this, this moment, um, I hope that one of the things that you've agreed to experience or pay attention to is what I'm saying. But of course, uh, as most clinical psychologists will, will tell you, um, you're probably swinging in and out, right? You're listening to bits of what I'm saying, and then your mind is wondering about, you know, the shopping you should have done this morning. Uh, did you uh, put your lunchbox in your child's school bag? Uh, did you switch off the heater at home? Is the hot water still on? Uh, so uh, so there's, there's all these things that are crowding in, in our attention, um, but we select to uh, pay attention to, to particular uh, things. Um, so. Attention, then, inescapably involves uh, value, as attention itself implies a choice that's determined by particular ends, safety, sanity, satisfaction. In other words, the kind of things that we pay attention to is because they're bound up with things that we value, such as the desire to know more things, the desire to feel safe, the desire to live in a clean uh, environment, and, uh, and so on. So in the circular relationship, of attention and value, subjects value uh, that to which they pay attention and pay attention to that, that which they, they value. So ends cannot be discounted in any credible uh, attention scape. So the purely economistic representation of attention uh, prevents us from uh, asking the most basic question, to what ends are our attention uh, directed, 
uh, that will decide uh, our, our future. Or to put it another way, if our future is strongly determined by those things to which uh, we pay uh, attention in the present, um, must not the kind of the underlying value system uh, of our selective attention be a matter of uh, explicit and sustained public address? In other words, uh, if I decide that one of the things that I'm going to pay attention to is, is transport here in Preshov. Um, so uh, I then have to decide, well, what is going to be, what are the ends for that transport system? Uh, will they be the mass movement of as many people as possible? Will it be the most economic movement of the greatest number of people as possible? Will it be to do with individual uh, comfort? Uh, will it be to do with social status? Uh, will it be to do uh, with uh, helping the car industry in uh, Slovakia, Germany, France, and, and elsewhere. So depending on the, the, those kind of values or, or, or ends, um, then you will decide to favor or to pay attention to developing a system of mass transit, or you will decide to develop the roads infrastructure in, uh, in, in Preshov and uh, elsewhere. So if the making, if you like, uh, legible uh, of a text or an environment, making it understandable to us, uh, demands the deployment of our uh, attention, in, o in other words, an experience that I agree to attend to, then attention is only intelligible in terms of our future-oriented uh, uh, values. And for this reason, uh, um, a theorist, uh, Aurélien uh, Gomboni, um, has put forward the notion of an ecology of attention as opposed to an economy of attention. Um, so from the point of view of an ecology of, of attention, uh, attention is always a form of interaction, and these forms of interaction are by definition uh, relational. Um, that is to say that attention implies a relation between attending subjects and the objects or persons to which uh, they attend. So this idea of relation is linked to the ecosophical notion of a relationism that has been developed by this man here, uh, Arne Nass, who, who died a number of years ago. He was uh, a Norwegian uh, theorist, develop uh, the developer of a notion of what's called uh, deep uh, ecology. And he says that individuals do not pre-exist their uh, relationships, that people and their organisms cannot be isolated from their uh, environments. That um, when we talk about the interaction between an organism and its environment, that this is a fallacy, it's a false statement, because the organism itself is already a set of interactions. In other words, that our bodies themselves, the only reason we can stand, sit here and function is because the multiple interactions that are already going on uh, within our body and between our body and the world around us in terms of monitoring uh, heat, uh, temperature, uh, well-being, uh, monitoring our, our visual systems, our uh, aural systems and, uh, and, and so on. So um, articulating then uh, attention within this kind of ecosophical notion of relationism means uh, taking uh, seriously the new forms of uh, practice, which are there in the, in the economics of attention, but embedding them more broadly uh, in an ecology of attention that discusses questions of values, ends, and sustainability. Um, what Citon, um, that I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, he, he argues that there's, there's sort of different types of um, ecologies that are brought together under the ecology of uh, attention. Um, and what he says, there's the biophysical ecology of our environmental resources, uh, the geopolitical ecology of our transnational uh, relations, the socio-political ecology of our class relationships, the psychic ecology of our uh, mental resources. And they all depend on the media ecology, uh, which determines all our modes of uh, communication. So you could say at one level that this media ecology is the most superficial of the different uh, forms, because it's merely the kind of reflection 
of the, the other. So it's a kind of superstructural uh, relationship. But another, it could be considered to be the most basic uh, ecology of all because it decides what we will or will not uh, pay attention uh, to. Um, so, how or where does translation fit into uh, all of this? Right? So you might think, yes, I like this idea of the economics of attention. It's true. I can see why it m makes sense in my, my, my life. Um, yes, I can see why translation is important in a globalized multilingual world. Uh, yes, James is right about his notion of attention. That seems interesting. I see how this can fit into an ecology of attention. But I'm interested in translating and interpreting. I'm interested in questions of identity. So how does this relate uh, to you know, what my uh, interests are? Um, and I want to, um, to shift slightly to uh, a novel by, in English by a Nigerian uh, novelist, Shimamanda Ngozi Adichie, uh, called Half of uh, a Yellow uh, Sun, which I can't recommend too strongly. It's an extraordinary novel about the uh, Biafran uh, war. It's part of Nigeria that decided to uh, secede uh, in the late 1960s to seek its independence, and the movement was very, very brutally crushed uh, by the uh, Nigerian government at the time. But there's one, the, there's one particular passage in the, the, the novel where the heroine, she's uh, Olana, uh, and she's wondering um, what the friends of her new partner, uh, Odinibe, what they, what they kind of think of her. Um, and she's particularly worried about this very formidable woman, very strong, powerful uh, woman called uh, Miss uh, Adebayo. And she wonders what, what Miss Adebayo uh, thinks of her. And this passage... So neither was she sure of Miss Adebayo. It would have been easier if Miss Adebayo showed jealousy, but it was as if Miss Adebayo thought her to be unworthy of competition with her unintellectual ways and her too pretty face and her mimicking the oppressor English accent. She found herself uh, talking more when Miss Adebayo was there, desperately giving opinions with a need to impress. It's that typical thing. Sometimes we are nervous, uh, and what happens is you just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk, uh, rather than, you know. Um, so what's interesting here is you see the, the tension between how Alana wants to be perceived and how she is perceived. The mental image that she has of herself and how she thinks Miss Adebayo is thinking uh, about her. Um, so what she's battling against is these false perceptions uh, of the person that she thinks she actually uh, is. What Alana is doing there is she is articulating a notion that has been in European uh, philosophical traditions for a very long time, the notion of authenticity. Um, from Rousseau to the Romantics to Sartre and uh, existentialism, um, the notion that appearances are deceptive uh, and irrelevant to any authentic uh, view of uh, self is seen to be extraordinarily important. In other words, the idea that... Um, we'll, just, we'll let people come, come in here. Is there room for everyone? Uh, right. yeah. Between classes, is this? Yeah. Okay, so, uh, so it's this kind of notion that, um, that our true self is not the self that's just captured by mere appearances, that there's a kind of an authentic uh, core to, that is beyond. Um, the difficulty is that in an economy of attention, the economy that we, we live in now, um, visibility is, uh, is everything. Um, if attention, if you like, is the kind of hard currency of cyberspace, uh, then Michael Goldhaber argues that flows do not simply anticipate flows of, of money, but that they actually end up replacing them. In attentional capitalism, attention is fast becoming the dominant form of, of capital. For um, Yves Citon, this kind of what he calls the um, 
the ontology of this new form of economic activity um, is the ontology of visibility. Right? So the degree of existence of a being uh, is dependent on the quantity and the quality of the perceptions of this person by others. Right? So from the quantity of YouTube hits uh, to the number of Twitter uh, followers, uh, to the number of uh, Facebook uh, friends, uh, value is heavily invested in forms uh, that accrue attention capital. Mm -hmm. um, so on the website, for example, the state government of Victoria and Australia, future entrepreneurs are encouraged to think of social media as fundamental to their very existence. And this quote, your business can now use social media to tell your story and demonstrate your expertise on a global scale uh, in real time with very little cost. So, and young graduates are repeatedly told of the importance of getting onto to LinkedIn and other sites. Um, so if attention then is the currency of what Berhardi is called semio-capitalism, uh, what are the implications for uh, translation? Um, how is the ontological, how is the status of translation affected by these new regimes of uh, visibility? Um, a work that I'm sure you have uh, come across um, in uh, your lectures is uh, Lawrence Venuti's uh, The Translator's Invisibility, um, where basically what Venuti argues, um, this work from 1995, is that translators have been hugely, there would be no renaissance without translators, there would be no scientific revolution without translators. Uh, there would be no translation of Islamic uh, medical texts into Europe in the 12th century without translators. Um, the Goethe, Shakespeare, uh, Proust, none of these people would have their reputation if it wasn't for translators. But when you look at literary histories, uh, when you look at national histories, when you look at cultural histories, when you look at histories of science, translators are completely absent. They are invisible. Um, so he says, and he uses this term then, invisibility, to describe how translators have got, got written out of, of history and how translators themselves are often complicit in their own invisibility. Um, they don't want to draw attention uh, to themselves. That the, the best translation is a translation that doesn't feel or read like a translation, where you're not aware of the fact that it's been translated. So, so being invisible is a, a, a good thing. So he talks about these two forms of invisibility. Um, what's interesting is that most of Venuti's examples uh, are situated within print culture. Um, and they're within the kind of the cognitive economy of the print uh, world. However, the notion of visibility for translation has gained, has gained rather than lost importance uh, as we move into post-print or digital uh, culture. Um, so if we consider my, my earlier uh, argument that a significant shift in economic activity, shift from production to uh, promotion, then translation products themselves uh, must by definition become uh, a part of what's sometimes called the attentional arms race, right? The competition, the race to get your attention. So translations themselves are competing as much for your attention as uh, anything uh, else. Um, and one of the great difficulties, for example, in world literature, one of the difficulties for literature written in my mother tongue in Irish Gaelic, one of the difficulties for literature written in Finnish, in Slovak, uh, in, in Danish, uh, is in, if you like, the world literature agora, the world of, 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 of publishing, um, how do you capture the attention of potential uh, readers uh, in order to, uh, if you like, express or give voice to the different forms of uh, literature. Um, this pressure is all the greater because there's a fundamental problem in the new digital uh, age, which is a kind of tension uh, between cyberspace and cyber. Uh, time. Um, if cyberspace is potentially unlimited, you know, the, the actual kind of storage capacities in our computers 
just keep increasing the, the amount of uh, information I can put on one of those little USB keys keeps increasing uh, all the, uh, the time. Um, cyber time is not. So cyberspace can be expanded uh, potentially indefinitely, uh, but cyber time uh, cannot. It is bound by the very real limits of the finite organic physical construction of our uh, human uh, cells. Um, so what that means then is that the amount of time that we have at our disposal to treat this expanding amount of information in cyberspace is bounded by very real uh, limits. So on the one hand, you could say that what digital uh, age has done is that in terms of promoting smaller uh, literatures has opened up you know, huge possibilities of dissemination uh, worldwide. So we have this cyberspatial expansion of, of the literatures. Um, but the difficulty uh, is in the, the domain of the uh, cyber uh, temporal. In other words, um, how to make a writer or a literature or a language visible in the kind of the electronic or the digital uh, agora. So, and this anxiety around uh, visibility becomes uh, manifest in the language of promotion itself. Um, in 2013, uh, the Flemish Literature Fund, um, which supports the kind of funding of translations of Belgian uh, Dutch language uh, literature, um, it co-organized an event in the, the UK, in the United Kingdom, under the heading High Impact uh, literature from the Low Countries, and it was described as the, in the following way. From the, till the 14th to 19th of January 2013, the Flanders House London and the Netherlands Embassy in the uh, United Kingdom present High Impact, six top writers from the Low Countries on tour to six cities for six nights of readings and debates to showcase, uh, to showcase the best high-impact literature from Flanders and the Netherlands in English translation. The authors of the Low Country uh, are all prize winners and bestsellers back home, all writing in Dutch from two different uh, countries. Um, and uh, now, for the first time in a unique collaboration, six of the best Dutch language storytellers are coming together for a rock star style tour of six English cities to perform for the English public and to discover what they may or may not have in common. So just think of the language of that. You're getting the kind of language um, that we use to rank our universities now, um, high impact, uh, with the kind of the, the implicit background of the metrics of visibility. There's a mention of hits, there's a mention of citations. Uh, there's a mention of uh, visits. And this is kind of linked together with the more conventional politics of spectacle, a rock star style tour of six English uh, cities. So if the English public does not know too much about this Dutch language uh, literature, um, then you must mobilize resources to achieve the maximum amount of visibility uh, in the crowded Anglophone attention scape. So if you look at the language, what is it that's going to make the difference? It's the making visible of this, uh, in global terms, lesser used language, uh, lesser well-known uh, literature. So what the translation products, these, these, the translations of these different writers, they're, they're competing in this very crowded uh, attention scape, this kind of Anglophone uh, at, at, at attention scape. So what a translation uh, what becomes important is the visibility of uh, translation rather than the invisibility of translation which uh, Venuti was uh, talking about. In other words, that in the digital age, uh, visibility would seem to be the most important uh, thing of, uh, of all. Um, one of the uh, aspects of this that uh, I was um, particularly interested in, in this uh, book that came out in, in, in 2013, Translation of the Digital Age, is the difference that political scientists make between what they called uh, soft power and, and hard power. Hard power is the Americans in Iraq. It's tanks, machine guns, bombers. It's using military might to make political changes. Um, 
Soft power is the use of, uh, of culture, of language, of literature, of cinema to um, make people uh, better disposed to your country uh, and to your, uh, the goods that you're selling, the service that you're selling, and so on. So typically, for example, in my country, uh, when they have these trade missions, they first send in the dancers. Um, so you may have seen this thing called river dance, where people kind of clatter around. I'm not going to do a demonstration now, but maybe later on tonight. Um, but you know, where you've got this very, very fast music, very lively uh, dancing. Uh, so the dancers and the musicians go in first, uh, and then the men with the hard hats and the briefcases uh, and the laptops and the, uh, the PowerPoint uh, demonstrations to sell you the goods and services. So the idea is that for small globalized open economies like the Slovak economy, like the Irish economy, um, that, you know, obviously, uh, and partly to do with our experiences of colonization, uh, you know, we uh, have a very kind of slightly negative view of hard power. So what we're interested in is, 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 is soft uh, power. Um, and what soft power then means is that you've got to mobilize the cultural resources in your society through translation in order for that soft power to become effective. This then leads to what is called brand nationalism. Uh, so brand nationalism is how do you, in a very, very crowded world, with these kind of global uh, companies uh, looking to invest in different parts of the, uh, the world, how do you make your country stand out or make it different from uh, other uh, countries? Mm -hmm. uh, and you can do this in different ways. You can change your tax rates. Uh, you can make your cities more attractive places to live in. Um, you can develop all kinds of cultural infrastructures. You can make your country an interesting place for people to want to live in because they've read your literature, they've seen your cinema, they've listened to your music. So you see the way in which then this notion of, of, of kind of brand nationalism of soft power is in, in this kind of new uh, globalized open economy is fundamentally bound up with the operations of translation. Because again, go back to think of what I was saying at the, the start of my lecture, you can only pay attention to things that you can understand. Uh, and this is where, if you like, uh, translators uh, go into the, are, are in the heart of this uh, economy. Um, I'm just wondering how I'm doing time-wise. Do I have... Um, I'm, I'm coming to the end, good. Um, oh, I, have to, I do have a bit of time, yeah. Um, what I would like to do um, here in this sort of the concluding part of, of my talk is to refer to um, a, a notion of, 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 of translation um, and then to what I think is a future of, of, of translation. Let me start with the, 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 the idea of uh, a notion. Um, one of the things that is um, a common experience, um, you go onto uh, a website in a different language uh, if you're using Google, and one of the first things you get is translate this page. Hmm? For example, if I click onto any page that is not in English, uh, I get translate this page. Hmm? So even my own country, when I go onto uh, a page in you know, one of uh, our national languages, Irish Gaelic, I immediately get translate this page. Hmm? Uh, and then this little box beside it, nope. Hmm? Um, so, uh, but the idea behind that notion of Google uh, Translate um, is the idea of translation as an instantaneous process, something that is immediate, instantaneous, where the actual labor of the translation is made invisible. Right? So in other words, we have this paradox in the contemporary moment where translation in terms of soft power, in terms of brand nationalism, in terms of the economics of attention, um, is in many ways more necessarily visible than ever, but the actual labor of, of translation uh, itself becomes invisible in that kind of notion of translation as an instantaneous, uh, immediate uh, process. And what I would suggest is that one of the reasons, or, or one of the things that this is, is feeding off is um, a distinction that was made um, by uh, a social anthropologist called uh, Timothy uh, Ingold between what he called transport and the notion of uh, wayfaring. Uh, um, 
Transport is uh, basically about carrying people or goods across from one place to another. And so uh, you, you take something from point A to point B. So yesterday I went from Dublin to Bratislava and then went from Bratislava to, 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 to Preshov. Uh, now, I was a bit tireder by the time I got to the end of the journey. Uh, I was uh, just a fractionally uh, older than I was when I started the, uh, the journey. Uh, but, you know, in every other respect, I was still pretty much the same kind of, 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 of person. Um, so, if you like, in transport, the, tr the, the, tr the traveller himself does not move. In other words, yes, I got up at one point to go to the toilet in the plane, uh, or at one point the five-hour journey from, from Bratislava uh, to, to Preshov, you know, I uh, decided to get up and, and, and walk around, but otherwise I was sitting on the, so I, I didn't uh, move. Um, one of the consequences, um, so, so we can think about uh, translation as a form of transport, as taking something from one language and putting it into uh, another. So if you think of that kind of Google Translate, it's a kind of logic of, of transport. The notion of wayfaring, however, is quite uh, different. Um, he argues, for example, he's talking about particular places, and he says that they're like knots, hmm? uh, and the threads from which they are tied are lines of wayfaring. A house, for example, so he takes this example of a house, is a place where the lines of its residence are tightly knotted together. But these lines are no more contained within the house than are threads contained within a knot. Rather, they trail beyond it, only to become caught up with other lines in other places, as are threads in other knots. Together, they make up what I've called the meshwork. In other words, he says that if you look at a house, um, and you think of it as kind of a knot, and there's the line, so I enter the house, uh, you know, my parents enter the house, my friends <coughs> enter the house, they have a different life story, they, they bring different uh, stories into the, into the, the house, uh, and then when they leave the house, they go on and they experience uh, other uh, things. In other words, that the notion of um, translation, we can think of it as, as transport, as taking the contents from one language to another, hmm? um, or we can think of it as wayfaring, where, so the translator, with his or her particular history, his or her particular command of the language, uh, translating the text, this trans text when it gets translated then goes on to have another life in the, the other language because different people are reading it, different people are, are reacting to it in uh, different ways and, and so on. So in other words, the idea of, tr of translation is not a network like where you, you join up point A to point B, but rather it's a notion of meshwork where you've got lines of language knowledge, language experience, which if you like, uh, they cross at a particular po point when you're translating the text, and then they go on to have another life in their life of uh, reception. Remember, for example, that Google Translate, the statistical-based machine translation method, is based on millions and millions and millions of translations that have been made by human translators. Right? So in other words, what you're getting in Google Translate, what appears to be this instantaneous transport-like model, in fact, is a wayfaring model. It's the, it's the buried life histories of all the translators who've produced those translated texts, which are then statistically sampled by this uh, digital uh, technique. Um, another way of thinking about this is what's called the logic of inversion. If, for example, I was to draw a, uh, a circle here on, on the board, uh, and take a, a marker and then just, just draw uh, a, a, a circle. Um, there's two ways of viewing this. You could view the circle as this point that then is on the, uh, well, probably given that, oops. One of the subjects that I failed in my formal education was uh, art uh, at the age of 14, and you can see why. Um, but so, one way of viewing the, the idea of a circle is to think about the circle as the journey that my pen uh, makes uh, to create that circle. The other way of viewing is to view that circle as a dot, right? As something that is just there, is autonomous, self-contained, discrete, or separate. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so what uh, Ingle calls the logic of inversion is when people forget the journey that the pen has made to draw the circle and just see the point, just see the separate, discrete, separate uh, circle. Um, and when we think about the making invisible of the labor of translation, we could say it's that logic of inversion. Right? It's the, where you, the journey that's, that's taken to make these uh, translations is obliterated, is disguised, is not made e explicit. The importance of translation in the development of soft power, the importance of translation uh, in the construction of uh, identity for smaller countries and languages in a globalized, open economy, uh, all this gets masked, if you like, by particular kind of paradigms of tr translation uh, that are conveyed by certain notions of the, uh, of, of the digital. Um, which, if you like, um, brings me to uh, my concluding uh, point, which is how, if you like, um, to... Uh, to challenge this uh, logic of inversion. And what I would argue is that this is what an ecology of translation must set out to, to challenge. Um, I was saying earlier about the economics of attention that it tended to privilege means at the expenses of ends, means at the expense of, uh, of values. Um, Mary Louise Pratt and Vicente uh, El Rafael um, have talked about the way in which they talk about the weaponization of language in contemporary uh, culture. In other words, the way in which uh, language, for example, in uh, contemporary uh, conflicts uh, tends to be used as a kind of, of, of weapon. Uh, for example, if you look at what's happened in Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Syria, um, that there's a very kind of instrumental notion of the use of, of, of language. If you even think about the language that we use in foreign language instruction, that we, we use when we talk about translation, we talk about source languages and we talk about target languages. Right? As if the foreign language was a target, a kind of a moving uh, target that you, you had to, to hit. So it's a kind of, and the notion of a very kind of narrow instrumental use of, of language is bound up with that kind of weaponization of language. Language is a kind of an instrument uh, or a, uh, a weapon. Um, but more broadly, um, what you could argue is that an ecology of translation, um, what it must seek to do or to make available um, is the commons of language uh, itself. Um, e. C. Tom, for example, in this kind of attentional uh, ecosophy, um, he has axiom number 12, he says that we must learn to value background properties. So, in other words, that if we're to construct a new kind of economy, which we have to uh, as a result of climate change, we don't have an option. Uh, as Naomi Klein says, um, the, most, the surest way of making sure that we walk into catastrophe is to do nothing. If we just continue the way we're, we're continuing, uh, the worst will happen. Not. Um, so, uh, if we need to change them, the way we do our business, the way we organize the societies, the way we, we organize our economies, one of the things that Citon says is we've got to uh, value background properties. Um, and of course, one of the things that political ecology has argued is that we need to be attentive to all those things we took for granted. We took for granted the air that we breathe. We took for granted the water in, in, in our rivers, in our, in our streams. Uh, all of these were regarded as externalities. They weren't given an economic value. And of course, what has happened now is that this has come back to haunt us. This has come back with a, uh, a, a vengeance. And so there's a lot of emphasis now um, on what are called the commons. Um, so these are the water, air, climate, uh, traditional knowledge, all these things that are shared in common, that we have in common, and because they're in common, uh, they're not particularly uh, valued. They become sort of grounds rather than figures in uh, notions of uh, value. Um, so paying attention to what is in the background is uh, absolutely uh, vital. It's, uh, if you like, recalibrating attentiveness to produce new regimes of value that prize what we have in common 
if only because it is these things that ensure our common survival. The planet, of course, will survive without us. Um, it probably will be better off without us because we kill species on such a huge uh, scale that it would be a good thing for most species if we disappeared. Um, but if we want to ensure our common survival as a species, we must think about these things that we have in, in common. I would argue that language is also one of these things that humans hold in common. Uh, in their particular sense, the languages that we, we, we possess in our different societies, and in a global sense, language as a property that human beings uh, share. Um, so the logic of inversion, which feeds the, kind of the, the automated uh, instantaneous paradigm of uh, language, uh, that I mentioned in respect to Google, that keeps language firmly in the background. It keeps translation firmly in the uh, background. So recovering what I would call the language commons, recovering the translational e commons, is a de developing an ecology of translational attention that brings the wayfaring of languages and uh, cultural movement to the fore. In other words, in the contemporary digital moment, and we are in the contemporary digital moment, trying to go beyond or go outside the digital moment, as somebody said, is like trying to remove the, the sun. It's about exploring uh, notions of uh, identity in translation practices, in everything from translators' blogs to fan subbing, um, to see how attention is drawn to the processual complexity of language and culture as they move across global attention scapes. Um, this ecology of translational attention is also concerned with how routinized, uh, unreflective, or narrowly utilitarian views of language uh, impoverish the language commons and deplete the expressive resources of future uh, generations. So it's high time, in other words, to figure out what we're leaving uh, behind. So if we look or think about a country like Slovakia, think about a country like uh, Ireland, um, if we think about the kinds of economic regimes uh, we find ourselves, the cultural uh, regimes we find ourselves uh, in, one of the most, uh, if you like, striking things about the contemporary moment is that in order for food production to be sustainable, uh, in order for uh, urban living to be sustainable, uh, in order for economic activity to continue, we must reinvest in the particular, the local, and specific. Um, one of the problems, for example, with mass food production is that um, you had this kind of vast production of, of, of food, um, but this increasingly became very, very uh, toxic. Um, so what I would argue is that translators are, above all, people who are stewards of language resources, they're stewards of cultural resources, they're the absolutely indispensable uh, mediators in the new ecology of attention, uh, the new uh, ecological economy, the new political e ecology, that it only if it can recover uh, and restore the full complexity of the particular, the local and the specific, uh, do we have a sense of common uh, survival as a speaking species, a spe species who use uh, language and engage in translation. And finally, I would say that one of the things that we need to think about in terms of that is communicating with other species. Um, if we are to move to a future where we do not massacre other species on a massive scale, uh, one of the things is to think about how we're going to communicate with uh, other species. Remember the history of colonialism, the history of slavery. Once the languages of slaves, once the languages of the colonized were translated into uh, the major uh, languages, people began to realize that the slaves, the colonized, had a rich interior life, um, that they were, f you know, they were fully human in terms of their capacity to, to communicate, um, would we have the scale of species destruction that we have on our planet if 
we had developed translational models of communication with other species. So the, the final thing that uh, I, I would say, and you're probably thinking back to when you were children, um, to Tarzan, because Tarzan could speak chimpanzee, uh, giraffe, uh, ape, and many other languages. I'm not going to speak any of those. Uh, but what I will say is that in this new kind of translational ecology, we have to rethink the very uh, basis of uh, what translation is and what we uh, do uh, with it. But I realized that I talked about the infinity of cyberspace but, and the finite quality of cyber time, but you're probably, your cyber time is pretty exhausted at this stage, so uh, I'll stop there. And thank you for listening.